pegging. It's been a most productive month in the Nettlesome Boat Shop uh, with progress on a number of fronts. One of the most exciting features has been the arrival of this cedar planking from Maine. There's movement on the timbers, there's movement on um, the centerboard trunk, um, and a little bit of progress on the keel, but uh, there's no specific moment of reveal um, for any of those. So I'll give you a general update, and then you may have the question, why is this guy even doing this? And that's a good one that I'll try to answer, or at least um, talk about a little bit in this episode. In the last episode, I steam bent all of the white oak frames. The next step is connecting the port and starboard frames using the floor timbers. I've just gotten into the process of cutting these uh, timbers. You've got to go back to the plans, um, kind of assess the height refair a little bit and then um, establish the height for a temporary cleat. And once that's set or at least measured, then you can measure and create a template for uh, the floor timbers. Here's just a couple like pretty simple. Uh, um, temporary cleat goes here and you measure where the frame goes and then where the kind of um, keel height is. So piece of cake I do a rough cut on the bandsaw and then using a power planer, I kind of um, work the edges, smooth them out and so forth. I've got about three or four of those cut out and so that's kind of a slow process. Next up, I've got about a two-thirds completed centerboard trunk, which you can see here. Of course, I cut the pieces, the posts out of the um, white oak. Um, I cut the plywood, I um, epoxied and fiberglassed it, I painted it, and I got some 5200 um, from 3M as the kind of adhesive and sealant, uh, so that's great. I've cut the bed logs, um, and basically I've just got to cut out the rabbit. Then they can attach to the rest of the trunk, um, and then I can finish assembling it. There were two other kind of modest sources of delay in the course of the month, uh, which I was actually very glad for. Um, one was that we hosted some um, French exchange students from my hometown's sister city, um, Besançon, France. Another was that I went to a friend's farm who was working on a, a Newfoundland trap skiff and we steam bent the frames for almost every station in in his boat and that was a lot of fun um, we also did the riveting and so that was a learning experience and this is um, murphy griffin he's got a youtube series called neophyte boat rights that i thought was totally awesome then in a pleasant surprise it turned out i could get um, my cedar for the planking a um, couple months earlier than I first, than I initially expected. And that was because another of his clients from the region here was willing to bring it down for me for just the cost of like sharing the gasoline. That kind of fell into my lap. Um, it was arranged just kind of over the course of a couple of weeks. And so now I've got um, the cedar here and so it's seasoning and um, I can start really kind of incorporating it into my overall schedule which I'm pleased about. It was a little bit um, stressful because I was actually out of town when it arrived but um, neighbors came together to help kind of um, unload and stack it and now I've got it stickered outside and so I'm real pleased to have that also. Fundamentally, we've got the question, why am I doing this? And um, the answer is not so simple. 
couple of years ago, I remarried and started a new family. And um, we started spending time um, on the coast. It was a really sailing oriented environment. And I love that. It was so beautiful. And I thought, God, I would love to be one of these people who could sail. And so um, took lessons and started sailing. And I couldn't think about anything else. I've long had a latent interest in woodworking that I didn't pursue in graduate school, but I thought, hmm, do you know, like sailing, boats, wooden boats, woodworking, maybe I could make a wooden boat. And so we'll say on one level, it's just as simple as that. For the question of why a Haven 12 and a half, we'll get to that in a second. On another deeper level, um, I'll say this was a kind of period of transition in my life. Maybe we could say it's as simple as a midlife crisis. Um, I got tenure at my university and I was kind of thinking about like what I want to do next um, in my research. Um, I had kind of recreated a new blended family um, in a new city. And it was like, hmm, like not going to continue doing the same old things. What's a new project? Maybe most fundamentally, that kind of um, upheaval with, first of all, several years ago, the death of my first wife, and then the kind of um, resettling and recreating of a family um, in a region that I'm not from. It's been a long time getting used to living in a landlocked area in the middle of a state. This project kind of appeals to me on a number of levels, emotionally, intellectually, kind of logistically and practically. And, um, you know, it seemed to be actually a logic that um, I couldn't resist. I basically told myself no for about six months. Everybody around me said, you're crazy, you're crazy, you're crazy. And I told myself, this would be crazy. I don't have the space. I don't have the time. I don't have the money. I don't have the expertise. And you know what? Like those are all real significant challenges that I deal with on a daily basis every time I do something with the boat. But those kind of fundamental logics behind the project are in fact like much stronger. One of the things that appeals to me about sailing um, is the kind of long history of the activity and the kind of long um, set of traditional practices. So, of course, with boats, but also understanding like, the fundamental properties of lift that are key to making a sailboat go, right? Like, that is of enduring interest to me, not simply scientifically, but also because um, it is so key to understanding the long history of maritime navigation, exploration, um, and recreation, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can't understand world history without understanding sailing. By the same token, understanding celestial navigation is something that I have been pursuing for a while. Um, and it appeals geometrically, it appeals astronomically, um, but it also appeals in a kind of poetic way, right? Like if you can sail by the stars, like you will always know where you are going. And in a period or in many periods of kind of upheaval and uncertainty, like being able to um, place yourself in the world, able to place yourself in the cosmos, uh, I think is very comforting, right? Like that kind of spiritual, emotional, geographical wayfinding um, is key to sailing and is key to my enjoyment of this activity. 
in the end, I sort of decided that those um, challenges and those obstacles were far less important. They were um, easily surmountable compared to not trying to take on this activity that would bring together all of these resources, that would bring together all of these features, that would bring together all of these challenges. Not doing it probably would be worse. I'm not a crazy person or not completely crazy, even though I am fairly impetuous. Um, so I made sure to kind of consult the experts. Um, I talked to one of my like um, professional friends who's also, he's a maritime historian and he does public history in the same way that I do. He studies material culture in a little bit different way than I do. He's got a sailing background. It's actually far more robust than I have. Um, and I wanted to kind of hear what he thought of it or how he could kind of balance these two, or if there was a way to kind of bring together these interests. And it was a real interesting conversation. Um, so my name is Seth Brookman and um, professionally, I identify as an associate professor of history here at Temple University. Oh, I'm interested in boats too. Did I say that? Um, <laughs> and um, there's been a, uh, a through line in all my work um, that connects to maritime histories or histories of boats. Um, sometimes it seems sort of secondary to my primary current scholarship, and sometimes it has been. Um, Seth had figured out a way to combine his interest in sailing and in the maritime world with his academic and research career. And so he illustrated that it was it was possible in one way. And that was interesting and kind of inspiring to me and gave me a little bit of kind of courage to go forward. Your hobbies and your interests don't necessarily need to be separate or divergent from your research. Seth had built a nutshell pram that was designed by Joel White, the same designer who um, created the Haven 12 and a half that I'm building. Seth has worked on a couple of really cool projects with his students that's also kind of a, an inspiration to me. When I was thinking about what kind of boat I mean, I realized or I understood that I should not do one that was so large that it would be a five-year or 10-year project. Really what I'd like is a two-year project. We'll see how that goes. And for small wooden boats, um, people said, mm, to look at um, Chesapeake light craft. And I thought about it and I realized that I didn't wanna do a kit I didn't want to do kind of a plywood or a stitch and glue. What I wanted was to learn woodworking. What I wanted was to learn wood. What I wanted was to learn about the tools and about the processes. And so one name, one boat for like a small quality sailboat came up again and again. And that was the Harishoff 12 and a half, right? The Buzzards Bay always boat. And so I decided to investigate. Um, I talked to museum professionals. I talked to archivists. I talked to um, shipwrights and um, wanted to know about what this would entail, whether a total novice could take this on and um, how. I'll say, actually, the Harishoff, while well, I expect it will be um, a good boat, and it has a long history behind it, not just at the top levels of yachting, uh, creating multiple America's Cup defenders, um, but also for these kind of like smaller boats in the like Buzzards Bay area. Harishoff benefits from a real marketing effort. That kind of marketing with Captain Nat Harishoff being called the Wizard of Bristol, um, I think probably like obscures a wide array of quality boat builders, of quality boats. And, um, you know, the Harishoff name kind of dominates the first half of the 20th century wooden boat um, discussions, um, probably unnecessarily. 
I decided to take on the Haven as a kind of compromise. Basically, I did not have the space for lofting and I couldn't figure out how to get around that. I probably could now. Um, I have a set of like measured plans of the Nettle, um, which is a Harishoff 12 and a half at Mystic Seaport. And yeah, I could probably figure it out now. But I'm actually glad that I kind of took the reasonable step of taking on the Haven 12 and a half. There's a robust set of documentation. Not only are the plans good, um, Maynard Bray has a book that everybody uses, and there's a couple of um, YouTube series documenting this. And so I figured like, if I'm taking on something big, I want to know exactly what I'm doing or enough to kind of like, I want, I want guide rails. Right. Um, and so Haven has that, but I think Joel White and the kind of history of the Haven and the Brooklyn Boatyard is also um, a pretty interesting phenomenon that I've been happy to learn more about. Joel White was the son of um, the author and poet and editor E.B. White. Right? Their kind of relationship, their kind of story is um, phenomenally interesting. And I think it not only probably informs Joel White's designs and it informed his career, it can help us move beyond the simple reverence for Harishoff. You know, one of those challenges or one of those things that I wanted was to kind of develop a new feeling of community. I had moved from the Midwest more than 10 years ago to Appalachia, and I still live in Virginia. And I made um, some very close and meaningful friendships um, on the other side of the state, but I did not have a kind of larger family. So I, in fact, kind of had to give those up or had to sacrifice those in favor of building a new family. And um, what I wanted was to create a new kind of community, a new set of friendships um, that were based upon this like very compelling set of interests. And so um, I connected with um, Chuck Jenkins, who has one of those um, series, video series about building a haven. And like Chuck's totally awesome. Um, by the same token, um, connecting with Murphy Griffin um, was another one. This guy is so smart, so interesting, so skilled. And I was just happy to um, be able to help in his development of his boat. The challenges of building a meaningful life, they come about, they remain, they endure every single day, every single month, every single year, every single phase of life. And um, thinking about how do I connect to my new family and how do I draw upon like these kind of resources and relationships and how do I make a new life out of that? Um, I think is tied up with a boat, right? Like I love swimming, I love sailing, I love rowing. I love everything about the water. And I want the kind of remainder of my life to be centered in the water. And this boat is not just kind of a, a, a vehicle of recreation. I think it's also going to be a vessel for kind of carrying me to this new phase of life. I'm building a new boat but I'm building a new life, right? Like once I've got the boat, you've got to center your life around giving it a place to go, right? Giving yourself a set of experiences and ways to use the boat. And so this fundamentally is about like building a new life for myself, for my wife, for my family. And I think that's what makes it so compelling and what makes this crazy, almost like unimaginably difficult task, um, not only reasonable, but really necessary. We'll see what the process is like. And I wanna thank you for joining me uh, along the way. In you, in you, I see myself, or what I like to think is me. 
You are the man, the little man, I've never had the time to be. In you, I read the crystal line I'll never get around to writing. In you, I taste the only wine that makes the world at all exciting. And that, to give you breath and blood, was trick beyond my simple scope is everything I know of good and everything I see of hope. And since to write in blood and breath was fairer than my fairest dream, the manuscript I leave for death is you who supplied its theme.